Father, we thank you for the um, opportunity to worship you, to gather together in fellowship and eat and, and get into your word. Um, we pray that you would speak to us, Lord, that you would deliver us from evil. We pray that you would lift up our hearts, Father. We pray that anyone that needs deliverance will be delivered tonight through your word. Father, we pray that anyone that needs to be healed will be we healed tonight through your word. Father, you say you sent your word for deliverance. You also sent your word for healing, Father, so we know that you can work through your word. And we pray that as we fellowship together, Lord, we will connect um, and be able to, to minister one to another and continue to do that um, through this message and afterward. In Jesus' name, Lord, you put us together, Lord, to, to minister, to, to love on one another and uh to lay hands and and to, and to care for one another father so i pray lord that uh, you will continue to, to knit our hearts together in love tonight lord um, help us to agree on the scriptures so that your power can flow in our congregation in jesus name i pray amen, amen. amen. all right so we are finishing our our series on um transformation mentality transformation mentality is basically um a lot of narrow road type of, of teaching stuff that you know if you're already saved we know you're saved it's okay we're not trying to take away your salvation or nothing like that but these are things that um they're not necessarily salvation issues they're more fruitfulness issues they're more um you know you start out in the kingdom and you learn the basics and we're going to start basic training next week so please invite you know people that need a new start people that maybe backslid and maybe want to start again um, invite new believers and everything like that um, next week um, but this week we are finishing the the narrow road series i call it the transformation mentality basically renewing everything and and looking through all the things that need to be looked at to actually renew our mind and totally transform us and be, make us totally different and separate and set apart from the world system. We started out talking about, you know, the most high reigns over heaven and earth, talking about how we, we, we look at globes and we think that NASA and, and they went to space and all that stuff is, is not even real. We look at, um, then we looked at the second commandment, you know, getting rid of graven images and then looking at the commandments. We looked at taking our brains back taking our brains back from entertainment, taking our brains back from the education system and the lies that get taught in the education system. Amen. Then we, we, went to, we went through mind, we went through money, we went through marriage, and we went through ministry. So we went through, we talked about the kingdom economics, renewing our mind on how to share with one another, how even from the Old Testament to the New Testament, we always were commanded to be, to, to help each other. Um, and how... In the New Testament, he said um, that there may be an equality, you know, and so how we have a responsibility to help one another. And we talked about the purpose of the tithe and offering, and a lot of people are confused about tithing nowadays, but really the main thing to understand is that the purpose of the tithe, the tithe is set forth for a purpose, is to bless the poor, is to follow the, poor, the poor, the fatherless, and the widow, is so that the priests and the teachers can be supported so the singers and musicians can be holy and supported you know by the tithe and this is for the administration of the ministry and it's really simple and if we're going to rebuild a tabernacle of david that's part of it um and then we also talked about marriage we talked about ending the attack on men um and we talked about how feminism is a weapon of mass destruction and how feminism has really wrecked uh the body of christ and has wrecked marriages and it's wrecked the churches uh, we talked about that, and then we went to ministry. And so, mind, money, marriage, ministry, transformation mentality. And uh, so, we, we last week we started ministry, and we talked about, um, you know, just confirming your obedience to the Word, and uh, getting rid of appearance, get a, getting rid of appearance-based ministry and going to the heart, okay? Um, and so, today, our last message, we're going to talk about uh, principles of sound biblical interpretation with tough topics. So we're going to look through principles of sound biblical interpretation, and then we're going to cover some tough topics and use those principles to come to an understanding and conclusion on those tough topics. This is 
This is going to be a deep message. This is a very hard message. This message has some some stuff behind it. You know, this message will lose you some friends. <laughs> I've lost friends over this stuff, and this is like this is some hard stuff to teach, but it's very necessary. And this is uh, is where this 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 is the type of message that comes from personal experiences of pain and suffering, like. Praying to God like God, where, how do I understand this? How do I get this? And that's where this message came from. All right, so um, first thing I'm going to talk about is number one: don't let seminary. Well, it's not number one; just a statement. Don't let seminary scissors steal your inheritance. Seminary scissors. I, I quote unquote trademark that term, but <laughs> seminary scissors is what I call something that. Um, that is commonly taught, but is not true. And they'll teach you how to cut certain scriptures out of your Bible. Oh, that was just for that culture. Oh, that was just, you know, that's not really, that doesn't really apply. And those are what I call seminary scissors. And what seminary scissors are set to do, seminary scissors will steal our spiritual inheritance from us. It's a thief. So renewing your mind in the authority of Scripture requires you to let Scripture interpret Scripture. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. If you want to interpret Scripture, you have to use Scriptures to interpret Scripture. Only the Word, only God knows the Word of God. Only the Holy Spirit knows the Word of God. If you let seminary scissors cut stuff out, then you'll never really understand the Word of God. Don't get caught up using some, somebody's seminary scissors to cut out the Scriptures you don't like. Be a doer of the word and produce fruit that remains. Amen. All right, so we're going to talk about using scripture to interpret scripture, and we're going to talk about principles of sound biblical interpretation. I'm going to write these down on this little sheet here, and then we're going to talk about them with some tough topics and use these principles. All right, principle number one if you teach scriptures with the goal of pleasing people, Rather than teaching obedience, you will end up a liar. So principle number one is teach obedience, not pleasing people. A lot of us have different gifts and talents. You know, some people are exhorters and they like to encourage people and like to make people feel good. Some people are teachers, they just straight about research and facts. Some people are prophets, they have strong convictions. You know, some people are rulers, they won't tell everybody what to do. <laughs> everybody has different gifts with the way they, and their gifts actually color the way they approach the word. So we have to make sure that we, we don't let our personality or our pains or our wounds or our experiences change what the scriptures say. We should teach the scriptures with a goal of teaching obedience, not pleasing man. You cannot please man and be a servant of God. So if you have a friend who doesn't want to hear it, and you change it because your friend might not like it, you're going to end up a liar. Proverbs 30 verse 5, it says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to them that trust in him. Add thou not to his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. So if you teach to please people or to make people happy, rather than to teach obedience, you end up a liar. Um, Matthew 5 has a scripture concerning this too. He says, if, uh, he said if, well, let's see, let's turn there. Matthew chapter 5, yeah, teach men to disobey them, then you'll be least in the kingdom, right? Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, who's, 519. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So we can't cut scriptures, cut, cut the laws of God out of the word. 
Because um, then you'll be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Okay, um, number two, integrity, not excellence, gives you stability. Be sound, be stable. Okay, so a lot of times people think it's about your intelligence. They get these degrees and they have their nerdhood and <laughs> they think being a nerd qualifies you for, for being a teacher. You know, a gift of a teacher is a great gift to have, but if all you have is smartness and intelligence you don't really have a lot because it's integrity not intelligence integrity not intelligence that's number two principle of sound interpretation is integrity not intelligence everybody say integrity, integrity. not just intelligence not just intelligence okay so integrity means to have a sound and stable platform is a foundation. If you build something with no integrity, then it's going to fall over. The higher it gets, it's going to fall over. Like the Eiffel Tower or the Leaning Tower of Pisa, right? You know, the foundation was a little bit off. The higher it got, the more it went off. Okay, so it's integrity that gives you a solid foundation. And you have to build it brick by brick and be stable. Don't take any logical leaps. Oh, I don't want to believe this. So I'm just going to think this way. No, you need to have integrity. A scripture for that is 1 Thessalonians 2. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5. It says, oh, let's go actually search verse 3 it says for our exhortation was not of deceit nor of uncleanness nor in guile but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel even so we speak not as pleasing men but God which tries our hearts for neither at any time use we flattering words as ye know nor a cloak of covetousness God is witness nor of men sought we glory neither of you or nor yet of others when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. So he's saying, listen, we didn't have any motives to deceive or to get gain favor or to please men. We had integrity. Another scripture for this is Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, With all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved, and for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. We talked about the scripture last week when he's talked about confirm your obedience. Okay? If you don't confirm your obedience, God can send you delusion. You know, just like Judas. You know, and when as soon as the Satan entered into Judas, what did Jesus say to him? Jesus confirmed it. Go ahead. Do what you do. Do it quickly. So just because you hear God's voice doesn't mean <laughs> you're doing the right thing. Sometimes if you seek God to disobey him, he'll say, go ahead. I already told you what to do, but you don't want to do it. Go ahead, right? So that's why it's integrity. And you, don't, you want to have the love of the truth so that you can be saved and not be deceived because a strong delusion will come to those people that don't love the truth. All right, that's principle number two, integrity, not intelligence. Twelve. Principle number three of sound biblical interpretation. One scripture cannot contradict all surrounding scriptures. One scripture cannot contradict all surrounding scriptures. When you're using scripture to interpret scripture, you can't take one scripture in the chapter and say, well, that cuts everything out. Did he already say it? No. If you think that, then you don't understand it. Contradiction is twisting the scripture. Agreement is purpose. Okay? So when you find the purpose of scripture, you have agreement. When you have, when you find, when the scripture seems like it's contradicting, that means you've twisted it. 
All right. So point was number one principle, teach obedience, not pleasing people. Number two principle for sound biblical interpretation, integrity, not intelligent, not just intelligence. Principle number three for interpreting scripture, one scripture cannot contradict all the surrounding scriptures. All right, point number four. The Holy Spirit expresses God's purpose. So, um, holiness means to be set apart for God's express purpose. The Holy Spirit, having the Holy Ghost is very important in scripture interpretation because the Holy Spirit knows the prophetic purpose of God. Okay, just to give you an example of this, um, like, I, like I said, there's a scripture in Isaiah that says, Behold, a virgin shall be born with child, right? If you look at the context of that scripture, it's not necessarily, it's talking about um, by the time the war is over, it'll be within 10 months because the virgin has had her child, right? But in the New Testament, the New Covenant, the Holy Spirit used that scripture to prophesy about Jesus because he was a virgin birth. Behold, a virgin shall be born with child. So the Holy, knowing when the Holy Spirit, when through the Holy Spirit, you know the express purpose of God, that's that's when you can actually interpret scripture prophetically because you know God's purpose already. And so a lot of times people will get stuck in context. But the Holy Spirit has a right to use scriptures out of context. And you see that all over the New Testament. And people think that's weird when I say it. But it's all over. All the apostles, they use scriptures out of context. But they used it because they knew the Holy Spirit and they knew what God was doing with those scriptures. Okay, so they knew that Jesus was Lord. They knew that he rose from the dead. They knew that he was the Messiah. So they would look at the Old Testament scripture and say, oh, that was also about Jesus. You know, it was, it was about what it said, but it was also about Jesus Christ because he was a Savior. And so you have to have the Holy Spirit. You can't, <laughs> you can't just be an intellect and think you know the scriptures because you have to have the Holy Spirit. You have to know the purpose of God. Okay? So that's uh, number four. The Holy Spirit expresses God's purpose. You have to have the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit expresses God's purpose. That doesn't mean you can just take a scripture out of context and use it for what you want. You know, <laughs> but it does mean if you know God's expressed purpose, you can use that scripture as a form of faith in what he's doing. Y'all understand? So it's very important to know the scripture in context, but it is also important to know that the Holy Spirit is the context of scripture and the Holy Spirit owns the patent on all scripture. The Holy Spirit owns the patent. The Holy Spirit owns the copyright. On the scripture. So you had a Holy Ghost, he'll teach you what that scripture meant, especially concerning and specifically concerning God's expressed purpose. Um, let's see. Like I said, there's many scholars that know the Bible back and forth, but they don't have the Holy Spirit, so they don't believe anything in the Bible, right? The Pharisees and, and the Jewish culture, they they read the scriptures, they knew the scriptures, but when the apostles came talking about Jesus, they didn't they resisted the Holy Ghost. And so they did not understand anything they were reading because they didn't have the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit um, has the patent on scripture. Another thing this means is you can't you you can't use empirical evidence. To interpret scripture. You can't say, well, this didn't work. So it must not mean, it must not really mean that. No, the Holy Spirit determines what it means. Okay. Um, you can't use empirical evidence to interpret scripture. You can't, you know, you can't go by the early church fathers. <laughs> you see a lot of that nowadays. People want to do a little bit of historical research and then want to cut out the scriptures because the early church fathers didn't do it or didn't believe it or whatever. What are your church fathers or the Pharisees or the denomination that you follow doesn't determine what scripture means. Okay? Um, let's see. So, um, I 
Apostolic doctrine interprets scripture according to Holy Spirit prophecy. So we have to understand, we have to be filled with the Holy Spirit, and we also have to understand Holy Spirit prophecy and able to interpret scriptures the, um, the right way. All right, number five, principle of biblical interpretation. One scripture cannot contradict clear doctrine that has been established by two or three witnesses. I think this is probably a duplicate, but oh well. <laughs> One scripture cannot contradict uh, two or three witnesses. Okay. Um, okay, I know what this is about. This is a little different. So, one scripture cannot contradict two or three witnesses. The Father agrees with Jesus. Jesus agrees with the prophets. And the prophets agree with the apostles. So, one scripture cannot contradict two or three witnesses. The Father agrees with Jesus, Jesus agrees with the prophets, and the prophets agree with the apostles. When you talk about apostolic doctrine, it's all harmony. Everything is based on harmony. And the clear one of the one of the biggest mistakes people make is they believe that the New Testament is different from the Old Testament. Um, you know, that the Father doesn't agree with Jesus. It's all one book. It's one God. You know, the apostles agree with the apostles agree with the prophets, the prophets agree with Jesus. Jesus agrees with his father. It's not too different, you know. I mean, it's, it's new ministrations. You know, we talked about that a few weeks ago, but it's one scripture. The scriptures cannot be broken. It's all one story, okay? Moses administered the law a certain way, but Jesus administered it in a better way, okay? So they agree, right? And... And the, the prophets agree. And even Mo, we're going to talk about how Moses came and told them, like, listen, somebody's going to come. <laughs> and these, you know, hear him, right? So they agree. Okay. So one scripture cannot contradict two or three witnesses. There is always harmony between the Father, between the Son, between the prophets, and between the apostles. Agreement is not only a goal. It's also a tool for interpreting scripture. Agreement is a tool because if you know there is agreement, then you know you can use that to interpret. Because I can say, listen, I know Jesus agrees with the Father. So if Jesus says something that I think is weird, let me see what the Father said about it and then harmonize those things. Same thing with the apostles. If, Peter, if Paul says something and you don't think Jesus said it, check again. I guarantee you Jesus either said it or he lived it. And Paul just said it in a way that was different. Okay, so God's express purpose has already been declared. The apostles agree with Jesus. Um, the apostles agree with the Holy Ghost and they agree with each other. The Holy Ghost agrees with Jesus. Jesus agrees with the Father. If you think there is a disagreement, you are wrong, not them. If you think that Jesus is or Paul is off, I guarantee you it's you. It's not Paul. Right? If you think that the Father in the Old Testament was off and Jesus is the real deal, I guarantee you it's you that's off. It's not the Father. Okay? So agreement is actually a tool for interpreting Scripture. Okay. Uh, we're going to go through point six. Point six. Jesus is that prophet. Hear him. Jesus is that prophet. Hear him. Uh, 
Um, so Paul, let's go to Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy 18, verse 15, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him shall you hear it. Hear, unto him shall you hearken. This is Moses, and he's saying, listen, there's going to be another prophet from within our tribe, from within our, our nation, that the Lord is going to raise up. And what he, he's talking about, Jesus, he's saying, listen, I'm giving you this, but guess what? There's going to be another prophet, and you need to listen to him. Okay, so they're in agreement. According to all that thou desired of the Lord thy God in horror of the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of Yahuwah my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. And Yahuwah said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto you. And I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall not hearken to my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. So Jesus, Jesus is that prophet. Hear him. So Paul never contradicts Jesus. Paul only clarifies what Jesus actually does. Paul received direct revelation directly from Christ. You see that in first in Galatians chapter one. Paul received revelation directly from Jesus Christ. Let's turn to first Peter three sixteen. Hebrews, James, first and second Peter. First Peter three sixteen. I actually know. Second Peter three sixteen. Second Peter three fifteen. It says, Account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you. Also in all his epistles, speaking in them of those these things, in which are some things hard. To be understood. Everybody say hard. hard. To be understood. To be understood. Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest or argue about. Okay, people that are unlearned and unstable argue about the things that Paul wrote because they're what? Hard to be understood. So it may, like I said, it may seem like he's saying something off because we're unlearned and we're unstable and we don't understand that they, that they are agree in agreement. So this means that Paul is in agreement with Peter, because Peter is writing about Paul. He said Paul is writing his scriptures, and some things are hard to be understood, and people that are unstable and unlearned, and they're not doers of the word, guess what they start doing? They start arguing about what Paul said, okay? As they also do the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Okay, so some people twist Paul's words by saying that he contradicted Jesus and elevated, and some people elevate Paul above Jesus. Paul, Jesus, Jesus said, um, you know, if you teach not to obey my commandments, then you'll be called least in heaven, least in the kingdom of heaven. People will say that Paul, Paul canceled the law or Paul said the law was done away with, right? So which one is it? Is it Jesus or Paul? A lot of people will say, well, forget what Jesus said, Paul. Paul had the real revelation. Jesus, he said that just because he hadn't gone on the cross yet. You hear that? You hear people say that. Like in real life, people say that. <laughs> like, oh, he just said that because he hadn't gotten on the cross yet. After the cross, you know, it's all about what Paul is talking about. No. You're unlearned and you're unstable. And that's why you argue about these things. Because you're not a doer of the word and you're unlearned and unstable. They agree. Okay? When, when, 
when Moses said, Jesus, when Moses said, there's a prophet, hear him. Jesus is the one who's in charge. He is the king. Okay, so all the apostles agree with Jesus. Jesus taught Peter and he taught all the 12. And then right here in this scripture, you see that Paul, I mean that Peter affirmed everything that Paul taught. So that means Paul did not contradict Peter. And Peter did not contradict Jesus. And Jesus did not contradict the prophets. He came to fulfill what the prophet said. And, and, and Jesus did not contradict the Father. Okay, so agreement is a tool to interpret Scripture. You can use agreement as a tool. Because we know they agree. And if there seems to be a disagreement, then we need to improve our understanding. Some people twist Paul's words by saying he contradicted Jesus and then they elevate him above Jesus. Everything that he did before the cross doesn't matter. You know, just just go with what Paul said. That's error. Okay? Some people twist Paul's words by saying that he contradicted Jesus, so he's a false apostle. They'll say Paul is a false apostle. Some people are actually talking about that. They're trying to take Paul's scriptures out the Bible saying that he was a false apostle. That's not true. You just don't understand what he said. They're in total agreement. And Peter proves this when his, in 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16. Okay? The truth is that Paul was doing a very difficult work. He was taking salvation on the kingdom of Israel to the Gentiles. He was taking Hebrew thoughts into the Greek language. Okay? So Paul was doing a very difficult work. That's why his work is hard to be understood. Okay? He was translating... All the prophets, all the kingdoms, the gospel from Hebrew thought and Hebrew culture, and he was taking it into the Greek language and giving it to Greek people. Okay, so when you understand that, you can start to okay process it and say, okay, he is in total agreement with Jesus. He's just communicating it to a different group of people. Okay? And that's one of the common themes that you'll see when you're interpreting um, Paul's work and looking at these tough topics. Okay, so Paul harmonized with Jesus and never contradicted him. Okay, let's see. A lot of stuff I can skip. All right, so Jesus is that prophet, hear him. Seven. Seven is rightly divide the word. Don't be lazy. Everybody say, don't be lazy. Don't, don't be, lazy. be lazy. Rightly divide the word. Don't be lazy. Context is everything, but the Holy Spirit's purpose is the greatest context. Okay, you have to rightly divide the word, especially when it comes to the law. Um... I talk about this a lot, but you have to rightly divide the word concerning the law. There's creation law, there's the laws of love, there's the Ten Commandments, there's scientific law, there's the laws of nature. You rightly divide the word. You know, look at what, when you see the word law, look at what law it is. You know, you talked a couple weeks ago about people will say the law passed away. But if you actually look at the scripture, it's not the law that's passed away, it's the administration that passed away. Basically, he's Jesus is a new a minister of the new covenant. It's the same word, the same law, but we do it with the power of the Spirit. We used to do it by the letter, but now we do it by the Spirit. And the law um, is is used to kill our flesh so that we can live in the Spirit and then do the works of the law by the Spirit. Okay, so it doesn't mean the law passed away. It means the administration and the way that Moses did it has passed away, and the culture has passed away, and the the ordinances have passed away. The old ordinances have passed away. Um, so, we have to be able to rightly divide the word in terms of reading comprehension and rightly divide the word in terms of looking at the context of what law is being spoken of in that scripture. Um, if you check the context... The only ordinances and commandments that Paul spoke anything against 
were the ones that divided Israel from the Gentiles. Why? Because God's express prophetic purpose was to unite every nation in Christ. Okay, so that's an example of four. The Holy Spirit expresses God's purpose. So we can use God's purpose to interpret the scripture. If we know that the Old Testament has a prophecy about Gentiles coming into the kingdom, then we know why Paul is saying certain things have passed away because those are the things that were meant to divide Jews from Gentiles. But now, since Christ died on the cross, we're no longer dividing Jews from Gentiles. <laughs> and so now, those ordinances that divide Jews from Gentiles are passed away. But that doesn't mean you can start to commit adultery, <laughs> steal, kill. Like, it doesn't mean all the laws pass away. It just means the things that divide Jews from Gentiles are passed away. Okay? So... Um, that's an example of rightly dividing the word and using these tools. All right. Principles for sound biblical interpretation number eight. When in doubt, check a concordance. When in doubt, check a concordance and do some research. Let's turn to Proverbs 25, verse 2. Proverbs 25, verse 2. says, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Okay, so you have to be a king. You have to be honorable. Like our sister Cassidy was telling us about all the things that we didn't know about chips <laughs> and about McDonald's. She was she was in marshmallows and CJ was breaking it down too. It was like there's some young kings in here doing research out here to get tip hipping us to the knowledge, right? <laughs> so um, it's. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. The honor of kings is to search out a matter. It's okay to search out something. When in doubt, check a concordance. Look up the definition of the word. Do some research. Okay? Don't be lazy. All right. Principle, principle of sound biblical interpretation number nine. You don't know it till you do it. You got to be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. The word is not up for debate. <laughs> it's for fruit. Okay? So it's not about being smart and trying to win a debate. You have to be a doer of the word. You don't know it till you do it. The scripture says in John chapter 7. Let's turn there. John chapter 7, verse 17. If any man will do his will, everybody say, do his will, do his will. he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Wait a minute, I thought you had to know the doctrine, get all your doctrine right first before you do his will. Nope. If you will do his will, if you have a heart to do his will and you're set to do it, then you'll start to learn the doctrine. That's one of the reasons that, you know, like we were saying earlier, when does it start Doing the things that we we we, we want to do, because that's how we're really gonna learn. Okay. If any man will do his will, he shall know the doctrine. The Bible says, "Be a doer of the word, not a hearer only, deceiving your own selves." So if you're not a doer, you're just deceiving yourselves. No matter how how much you study. Okay. All right, so now let's look at these principles of sound biblical interpretation, and then looks at, and then look at some tough topics. So let's turn to First Corinthians seven. Do 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 do. 
First Corinthians 7. First Corinthians 7, verse 10, it says, Unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Who commands this? The Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband, but, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife. So it's basically saying, if you depart from your covenant spouse, your original covenant spouse, you are to remain unmarried, or be reconciled to your husband. Okay? Um, then verse 12, But to the rest I speak I, not the Lord. So this is Paul giving his, his advice by the Holy Spirit, or by his, uh, by his experience and his wisdom. If any brother has a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Everybody say, save your husband. Save your husband. How knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Everybody say, save thy wife. Save thy wife. Okay, so people will take verse 15 and says, If the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases. And they'll use that one scripture to change everything around it. When you look at what's next, it says, you might save your wife, so he still calls her the wife. He still calls her the husband. Okay? And then in verse 11, it says, if she depart, let her remain unmarried. So that means if you have to depart or you have to leave your spouse, you should remain unmarried. Okay, so when people get caught up by that word bondage, Okay, so we just use one script, one principle. One scripture can't contradict all surrounding scriptures. So if you use verse 15 to contradict everything that surrounds it, that's error. Uh, let's go back down to verse 39. It says, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. So the wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth. Okay, so you can't take verse 15 when it says bondage and then use it to contradict everything that's around in that chapter. Let's go to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 2. It says, For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. Okay, so that scripture is saying the exact same thing as 1 Corinthians 7.39, which we just read. So the only thing that breaks the marriage covenant is death. Okay, so if that's the case, then what does bondage mean in verse 15? What does it mean when it says a brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases? Being a servant, right? So let's, let's go down to principle number eight. When in doubt, check a concordance. Do some research, okay? So if we, if we see one scripture and it seems like it contradicts all the other scriptures, first of all, we can use agreement to know that it can't be true. It can't contradict the other scriptures. So now let's lose another principle. When in doubt, check a concordance and do some research. Um, if you look at the word bondage in a concordance, it's the word dulo. Dulos is a servant. So what it's saying is, 
a brother or sister is not under servanthood in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. So basically it's saying if your, if your husband or your wife goes crazy, they just leave you. You don't got to chase them down and, you know, say, I'm going to do your, I'm going to iron your clothes. I'm going to help your wife. I'm, if, if they leave, let them leave. You know, it's, it's peace, right? But at the same time, all the other scriptures surrounding it are not canceled. You can't cancel that one scripture. You can't use the one scripture to cancel out all the scriptures around it that says, let her remain unmarried or she might save her husband or he might save his wife. Or that the wife is bound by the law as long as the husband liveth. Now, the word bondage in verse 15, it means doulos, it means servanthood. The word bound in verse 39 it actually means a bond, like a chain, a marriage bond, like a covenant bond. Okay, so that bond is unbroken. And that bond, just like Jesus said, <laughs> what God has put together, let no man set asunder. Okay, let's go to Mark chapter 10. Another scripture that agrees. We talked about how Jesus agrees with the apostles. Tough topics, y'all. This is this is using uh, using principles of sound biblical interpretation to tackle tough topics. Mark chapter ten. Verse eleven, it says, Jesus said unto them, Whoever shall put away his wife and marry another commits adultery against her, and if a woman shall put away her husband and be married to another, she commits adultery. Okay, so that's very the, the, the exact same thing that Paul says. Jesus is also saying that same thing. Okay, so what is Paul saying when he says a brother or sister is not under bondage? He's saying basically this whole chapter, verse seven, uh, chapter 7, is about a one flesh marriage covenant versus serving the Lord. Okay, so you can actually if you go to verse... 32, it says, I will have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried cares for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married cares for the things of the world, how he may please his wife. There's a difference between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy, both in body and spirit. But she that is married cares for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. So basically the whole point of this chapter is if you're married, serve your spouse. If you're unmarried, serve the Lord. That's why he said if, you'll, if your wife leaves you or your husband leaves you, you don't have to serve them. Now you can serve the Lord. You don't have to beat them down and track them down. Just start serving the Lord. Now you'd like Paul. Paul was not married, so he was basically focused on serving the Lord. So if your spouse leaves you, now you can focus on serving the Lord and remain unmarried. So that word bondage doesn't mean that you can just go marry again it means that now you can serve the Lord because you're not under bondage or you're not under servitude to the person that left you. You can't serve somebody that's gone. If they leave you, you can't serve them. You know, you can't feed them breakfast when they wake up in the morning if they're gone. You can't iron their clothes when they're gone. You can't, you can't do these things when they're gone. So now you can focus on serving the Lord. So that's using principle number three, principle number five, and also principle number eight, to, to, to interpret scripture in a sound way. Let's look at another tough topic and see if we can use these scriptures, uh, these principles of, biblical interpret of sound biblical interpretation to interpret them. 1 Corinthians 11. When we talk about Paul's writings are what? Hard to be understood. <laughs> So that's why we have to use these tools. So all, we, all these all these doctrines that people argue about for thousands of years, hundreds and hundreds of years, these past 2,000 years, people have been arguing about these things. The Holy Spirit can reveal them to us if we use these principles of sound biblical interpretation. All right, so chapter 11. Remember, Paul is doing a tough job. He's trying to preach the gospel to Gentiles. The Greek mindsets and the Greek language. Okay? 
1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things. And keep the what? Ordinances. Everybody say ordinances. ordinances. As I deliver them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. The head of Christ is God. So he's establishing authority. God, Christ, man, woman. Okay? Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonors his head. So he's talking about ordinances. Remember, he's not talking about, you know, heaven or hell, or you going to hell if you don't cover your head and all this stuff. He's just talking about ordinances. Like, this is just the way we do it. Okay? The Old Testament had ordinances, the feasts, you know, um, the sacrifices. Okay? So, in the New Covenant, we've replaced the cultural ordinances of Israel with the ordinances of the apostles. And so he's giving, he said, I'm praising you that you remember me in all things and that you keep the ordinances. So he's giving them praise. Thanks, thanks for keeping the ordinances. You know, thanks for not making up your own denomination. Just keep the ordinances that as we deliver them to you. Right? Okay? So this is what this is part of those ordinances. Every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that is even all as one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Okay, so the man, neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. Um, so the man is not of the woman, but the woman is a man. He's established in the order. The man is the head, the woman is of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. The woman was created for man. Okay, that's how women are made. They're made to be helpmates. Um, for this cause, ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. We talked about that a couple weeks ago. Their angels are looking. The angels are the ones they're doing. They're the ones that are doing spiritual warfare. Michael is the one looking for what <laughs> he's looking for. What he can do to Lucifer. They're always constantly in battle. Okay, and so they're the ones that are carrying out the spiritual warfare of our words and our prayers. So what they're doing is they're looking um, to they're they're looking to see if we're in order, if we're decently in, in order, if our prayers are going to be effective, if if we're going to actually be worthy of <laughs> you know the words that we're speaking, if we're going to be doers of the word, are we going to do the same thing that Adam did, the same thing that Eve did, the same thing that Samson did? You know, he's the angels are looking. It said. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. So he's saying, listen, we have to work together. Women and men have to work together. But it has to be in order. Okay. Um, for as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judging yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray to God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory unto her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But, and this is the scripture that people use to do number three again, right? But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. All right, so alarm bells go off. Everybody, when people teach this scripture, the seminary scissors will say, all right, so since verse 16 is there, let's just cut out verse 1 through 15 and just scratch it out of our Bible. That's what the seminary scissors will say. But if you look at principles of sound biblical interpretation, number three, one scripture cannot contradict all the surrounding scripture. Okay? So, that means we have to dig deeper and find out what this really means. Okay? So, let's take a look. Um, so, when we look at, like I said, when we look at verse 2, we're talking about ordinances. Okay? So, the head covering is a reflection of the submissive heart. Number one, it's a reflection 
Number two, it's a reminder. Number three, it's a sign to the unbelieving or unlearned eyes. And it's also a sign to the angels because we saw the scripture. The woman ought to have power on her head because of the angels. Okay? So it couldn't be a cultural thing because if you look at all the, the scriptures in it, it wasn't about culture. It was about creation. It was about how women were made, how men were made. It was about spiritual spiritual warfare, what the angels looking for. It was about the ordinances of the assembly, how we come together to God's throne in decency and order. So the point of this whole doctrine or this ordinance is to display order because that's the first thing you talked about. You keep the ordinances, but I will have you know that the head of every man is, or the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is a man, the head of Christ is God. So he's basically establishing order. In order to have an ordinance, you have to have what? Order. The order creates the ordinance. And so what this doctrine is, what this ordinance is, is a display of the order that God has designed. It's a display of the order. And what he's saying is when we show up to the throne as an assembly, whether we're meeting, you know, in the word, or we're meeting in prayer, uh, when we show up to the throne as an assembly, at his throne, he wants us to come in decency and in order. And the ordinance is what we use to display that order. And that's what the angel's looking for. Okay? Um, so the order is the cover and the uncover. Okay? So the order is that the women are covered and the men are uncovered. Why does a woman cover her glory? Because... The glory should be for the God, for God, right? We shouldn't have to come into an assembly and look at all the beautiful, <laughs> you know, I mean, women are beautiful, period. But the Bible says, let no flesh glory in his presence, right? Of all creation, what's the most beautiful part of creation? What's the most beautiful part of creation that God made? The earth. Nope. The most beautiful thing that God created in earth. Is a and what specific human is it? It's the woman. It's the, the woman is the most beautiful part of creation, right? I mean, it's. I mean, I mean, it's just. I mean, obviously, humans are the pinnacle of God's creation because we're made in His image. And who are the most beautiful humans? The woman. They were made more beautiful than men. Okay, and so the covering. That's why we talked about last week. Or was a couple weeks ago. The reason we have to be, the reason women are commanded to dress modestly, is because we don't want, <laughs> because we don't want to let flesh glory in His presence. And it, as a woman, you know the scriptures command, it's okay to be beautiful, but just turn down the volume a little bit. <laughs> turn out, just turn it down. Take that ten down to a six and a half, maybe. You know, just cover it up. You know. Just so, just so that when we come to the throne and we pray, you know, God can get the glory. Yeah. Right. But, um, yeah, the covering is for the angels, right? But um, it's also, the Bible also talks about let no flesh glory in his presence, right? And so that's why he talks about the glory. Um, let's see. If a woman have long hair, it's a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Okay, so it's saying cover the hair because the one hair is a woman's glory, the one hair is a glory. Okay, so it's not necessarily something that, oh, you're going to hell or you're not going to hell or nothing like that. What it is is an ordinance. And what are ordinances for? He said, I have ordained you to bring forth fruit, that your fruit will remain. Okay, so um, let's see. So the shame is a long hair, short hair. The shame is not the order. The shame is to help us to understand the order. So a lot of people get this scripture confused. They'll say, um, they'll take the shame part and say, if a man have a long hair, it's a shame to him. Okay? And they'll take that, the ordinance. But the shame is to, dis is to explain the ordinance. Okay? So that's why it says, uh, let's see, if it be a shame... For a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. 
because the shame is the opposite of glory, right? So if it's a shame for your hair to be bald, that means it's a glory for your hair to be long. So if it's a glory for your hair to be long, then cover it up because let no flesh glory in his presence. Let us be modest when we come to the Lord's throne so that we can focus on the most high and not the beauty contest. Not the first lady. Oh, look at the first lady. How pretty she you know? <laughs> That's not what church is supposed to be about. That's not what the congregation is supposed to be about. It's not supposed to be a fashion show, you know, where people are showing off their bodies and showing off their long hair. And that's the ordinance. That's the ordinance. It's not a heaven or hell issue, but it's an ordinance, which basically means it will help you bear more fruit. The order is to help us bear fruit. He said, I have ordained you that you may bring forth fruit and that your fruit would remain. Okay? And I always use this example. Panera Bread. When you go to Panera Bread, the logo always looks the same. The colors are always the same. The food is always the same. If I got a Panera Bread on 7 Mile, and all of a sudden I decide I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to do my Panera Bread, and I'm going to make the, the carpet's going to be yellow. I'm going to have my own menu. You're not a Panera Bread no more. Why? Because you're not following the ordinances of Panera Bread. And so the ordinances help you to be productive as an assembly because you're following the ordinances. You're doing it the way that the apostles just prescribed. That way you don't have to come up with your own denominations. You don't have to come up with your own ideas. You can just follow the ordinances. And that's what it's for. That's the example I like to use because it helps people understand, like, it's not a, you don't have to have a franchise, but you do have to have ordinances because because the ordinances have been set to help us bear fruit, and to, to maximize uh, the, 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 effectiveness, the effectiveness of the ministry. All right. And so what's the shame concerning men? It says, if a man have long hair, it's a shame to him. Now, if that's not the ordinance, that's the shame to help you understand the ordinance. Okay? So we have to be careful with that. Um, so, if we see a woman that cannot grow her hair, we are sad for her. But if you see somebody that, you know, has, has cancer and has her hair shaved, is that, that's seen as, it's, it's, just, it's a sad thing. You like, you pray for her. It doesn't mean she's not saved, <laughs> but it's somebody, it's somebody that you pray for. It's somebody that, you, you know, it's like, oh, I pray, I pray for that. You have compassion on them, Okay. If we see a man that wants to be known for his beauty, we're sad for him, right? <laughs> when you see an effeminate man with long weave and, you know, and wants to be beautiful, more beautiful than his woman, that's a sad thing, you know? It, it means something. It means something happened to him, right? Doesn't mean he's automatically going to hell. Doesn't mean he can't be saved. Doesn't mean we hate him. It just means it's a shameful thing, okay? Okay, so... So that's how we understand the shame, and the shame helps us to understand why the ordinance is there. Okay, because we want to be fruitful. Um, so the order is for the woman to cover her glory in God's presence, and for a man to show that his glory is in the Messiah, not in earthly beauty, or like those that are still looking for a Messiah. You know, the Jewish men, they cover their head, right? Why? Because they're still looking for their Savior. But in the New Covenant, apostolic order, the men uncover their head in the presence of God because Christ is our head. We already have our Savior. We already have our Messiah. So that's, like I said, that's why the ordinance is there. It's to display something. Just like Panera Bread wants to display a certain picture. When you walk in, you know what you're going to get. It's the same design. It's the same service. It's the same uniform same menu so that you know wherever you go if I'm traveling if I want something to eat I want it to be healthy I want it to taste good I don't have to walk into some Panera Bread thinking they're going to serve something different everything is the same the same way the body of Christ is supposed to be he's supposed to speak the same thing you know he didn't want there to be division certain, certain churches follow Paul certain churches follow Peter the reason we don't the reason we have so much division in the body of Christ is because we don't understand ordinances. If we understood the ordinances and house to house, how that works, we wouldn't have any division. There would be no reason to divide because we would all just be doing 
example uh, exactly what what the Lord said. All right. So this is an example of why the ordinance is important. If you walk into a church and you see cleavage everywhere, what spirit do you think rules there? Jazzy. <laughs> Jazzy, right? You know. Like it's if you see cleavage and hips and long hair everywhere you walk into the church. Y'all know you already know what it's about. You ain't even gotta listen to the message. Like you know it's not gonna be you know it's gonna be entertainment. You know it's gonna feel good and nobody in there is gonna be changed. You know there's fornication going on in the choir. You already know it because you know the spirit of Jezebel rules. So the ordinances are meant to prevent that. Okay? If you walk into a church and you see a bunch of Absalom looking dudes with hair longer than women, what do you think is happening there? The same thing, right? Similar. You know, you see men that don't really have their connection. You see, um, you know, it's a sad thing, but, you know, you see a lot of, well, it's a couple things, you know, the, the abuse thing and the feminineness because of the, the, the abuse, sexual abuse, fatherlessness, um, but also it's a sign of captivity as well. It's a sign of captivity. And the reason I explain it like this is because every people has a glory, right? There's a glory of the European. <laughs> There's a glory of the Asian. There's a glory of the Native American. There's a glory of the Hebrew. There's a glory of the African, right? And so if the glory of your culture is your what? Your woman, right? The most beautiful. If you want to sit, when you have a beauty contest from uh, what what they call it? Uh, the Yeah, the Miss Universe or the Miss the Miss Universe pageant. What do they show? They show the most beautiful of that country, right? It's not the men. <laughs> It's the woman, right? And so a lot of times when you see men with long hair, it's a perversion of that glory because the glory of their woman is not being displayed. So they, they feel like displaying the glory of their woman. They, they feel like displaying the glory of their people. Because a lot, unfortunately, in our captivity in America, in our captivity in the Western Empire, our beauty is not seen as beautiful. And so a lot of our women, they follow the glory of the European. And so you see a lot of our men wearing the long hair, wearing the dreads, because we're trying to display our glory. Because our women are not displaying our glory. Our women are displaying the glory of another. They're displaying the glory of the, the Indian, <laughs> you know, the Asian. They're buying the hair from the... And they're displaying the glory of the Asian, and, and the men are like, man, I'm going to display the glory of, of our people. You know, and so it's a shame because it's a captivity thing. It's it's a result of not having our own glory being displayed. Okay. When you see um, Absalom in the script in the Old Testament, he was a self promoter. He was rebellious. He emphasized his beauty, and he died hanging by his hair. He had a lot of trouble. He had problems with his father. You know, so he ended up emphasizing his beauty to win people's hearts and try to take over the kingdom. Okay? Samson, he was a Nazarite. Okay? The Nazarite vow, a lot of people say, well, this scripture doesn't mean anything because the Samson, the Nazarite vow, he had a long hair. Well, the Nazarite vow does not apply if you're not living holy, if you're not fasting, and you're not drinking grape, and you're drinking grape juice and wine. Samson was a fleshly Nazarite just trying to look good but not living holy. Okay? Look what happened to him. Samuel was a Nazarite that actually lived holy as well. But remember, Jesus is that prophet. Hear him. What did Jesus say about fasting? He said, he, Jesus reset the fasting ordinances. Okay? Jesus reset the fasting ordinances. So he said... When you fast, don't appear to mend the fast. Don't make it different. You know, anoint your head, you know, anoint your face. You know, you don't have to make it display of your fasting. You don't have to dress in sackcloth and ashes and let your hair grow when you're fasting. So 
Jesus demands fasting without the outward show of a Nazarite vow, sackcloth, ashes. In, in the New Covenant, we fast in secret, not to be seen by men. It's not about sackcloth. It's not about long hair. It's not about ashes on the face. Okay? So it doesn't mean it's a sin to have long hair, but we, when we look at creation and we look at When we look at creation and we look at the scriptures, we see that it means something. Okay, it means something that is disappointing and sad. It doesn't mean they're going to hell. It just means there's something missing and we should supply what they lack. But that's not the ordinance, though. The ordinance is uncovered versus covered. The ordinance is not. You got to have long hair. You got to have short hair. Okay, the ordinance is what he. The the shame is what he used to explain the ordinance. So. Hope y'all understand that. Okay, so it's not a heaven or hell issue. Again, it's just a way that was designed for us to bring forth more fruit. Now, nothing to argue about. It's just tools and tips from the apostles <laughs> on how to run a successful congregation. Okay, and how to have fruit that remains. A man trying to emphasize his beauty as if he was a woman is a sad thing. It's a sad thing. It's a disappointment. When you see Michael Jackson, when you see Prince, when you see these rock stars, these should make these things should make our hearts flow with compassion. Like you should be like, oh man, I'll pray for you. I'm gonna pray for you. You know. <laughs> if you if you look at the scriptures, that's what it that's what it means. It doesn't mean we can have to condemn people, but it does mean we should be have our hearts flow with compassion. When you see a man that wants to look like a woman. It's like you should you should be in prayer for them. Okay? Um, these men have been spiritually abused and they're being pent for their talent. What makes a man want to appear like a woman? It's either a lack of confidence or, or some kind of abuse or some kind of perversion of natural or spiritual order. Okay? So we don't need to teach the ordinances with, with, do, the ordinances with dogmatism dogmatically or bitterness or disrespect but with care and concern and understanding a lot of people have been wounded a lot of people are fatherless we live in a fatherless generation you know people have been hurt people have been spiritually abused and that's why we see these things so we don't need to teach these these things with a heart of hate or pointing the finger we should teach it with compassion because people have been through certain things. People have seen, people have been abused, people have been told things about themselves, people have been cursed. And so when we have an understanding of what things should look like, we should be able to love people into fruitfulness and not try to condemn them because of the ordinances. The first thing should be the grace of God, the commandments, you know, the Holy Spirit, and then the ordinances further on. The ordinance is further on, okay? But also, show the example at the beginning. If a woman dresses to show off her body, there's a reason in her heart. It's not a good thing. It's something that she's missing something, right? So we should not look at her to condemn her, but look at her as a form of compassion and care. Prayer, what happened? You know, let's help, let's help out. If a man needs extra attention and wants to like a woman, there's a reason. Be aware, show care, concern, and understanding. The shame is not the ordinance. We should be able to love them through it. Love people through. Love people through these things, okay? The ordinances are a sign. The ordinances are designed to get right past your gifting and talent and cut straight into the flesh to test if you are ready to bear fruit that remains. A lot of times people have talent and they have anointing, okay? But the ordinances will constrict you to what's fruitful. And people want to depend on their talent and their gifting and their anointing, but the flesh will cut right past that talent and cause you to bear fruit. So a lot of times people will see your talent, like you shared earlier, people will see your talent and your gift, and they want to pimp you and use you. But the ordinances will constrict you, and then and you, you won't be able to be pimped or used because you're staying within what God has said. Okay? And that's what's going to help you bear fruit that remains and not just be a flash in the pan and be flashy and get famous and make somebody some money. But it's going to cause you to bear fruit that will remain. 
some ordinances are not necessarily heaven or hell, but they are ordinances to create and display order. Order makes keeping the commandments easier. God's order creates God's results. Our ideas create disappointing results. Okay, so that's an important statement. God's order creates God's results. Our ideas create disappointing results. And that's why you don't have to argue about these things. Because the fruit shows up. <laughs> the fruit of it is the fruit is obvious. You know, if somebody's arguing with you about the scriptures, you don't have to. Just bear fruit and let the fruit show us. Let this, the Bible says wisdom is justified by her children. Okay? Some forms of disorder are simply unfruitful. Some forms of disorder are harmful, unhealthy, demeaning, and disrespectful. And some forms of order are an abomination. Okay? So there's spiritual order. There's nat family order. There's natural order. Scriptural order and scriptural ordinances are for those who have made a choice to display God's glory in the way he has prescribed instead of the way they think will work. A lot of times we have clever ideas. We have our own conceits, which are conceits means ideas. We're wise in our own ideas. We're wise in our own conceits. I'm going to do it this way for this new generation. You know, I told y'all my testimony. I've been through all that. My younger years, which is, I mean, when you're young, you can do, you can experiment certain things. But the order and the ordinances are meant to cut past all that and basically do what God said. Do his will, do his word and do his will, but also do it his way. That's what the ordinances help us do. They help us do things his way so that you can have fruit that remains. Here's some questions that the ordinances answer. <laughs> Why do I have to obey my husband if I'm smarter than he is? <laughs> I'm more talented. I'm more gifted. I got more prophetic gifts. Why do I have to obey my husband if I'm, if I'm better? Well, the ordinances <laughs> will help you keep the order, right? Because doing things your way, even if you're smarter, even if you're more talented, it's not going to work. The fruit is going to be rotten. Why do I have to cover my hair in the assembly? My hair is more beautiful than his bald head. Because, <laughs> precisely, it's because it's more beautiful. Like, we need to be, we need to come together and, oh, thank you. I love you. You love me. <laughs> oh, glory to the Lord <laughs> of heaven. Hallelujah. Why do I have to follow this overseer when I'm more talented than he is? Why do I have to? Why can't we just do what we want? Why we, Why has it got to be in context of elders and people with and with wife and kids and all that? Husband and one wife and all that stuff. Why we got to do that? Why can't we just get out here and just... Well, the ordinances help you to bear fruit that remains. Why all this focus on family and house-to-house -house discipleship? I'm too gifted. I need to be seen. I need a stage. Lights, camera, and action. We can start an entertainment ministry and reach way more people. Why do we got to focus on discipleship and family first and house to house? That stuff is boring. Why do we got to follow these elders and cover our heads and all this boring stuff? Well, if you want rotten fruit, fruit that's going to pass, pass away, fruit that's going to go back to the world in a couple of years, do your thing. <laughs> but if you want to have fruit that will remain, godly families, godly congregations, disciples that bear fruit, that's what you do. You do it God's way. All right. Why have children? We can be a power couple. I can start a business. She can start a business. We can be billionaires for Jesus. The kids are going to slow us down. Well, that's not God's way. Okay, God said, be fruitful and multiply. He wants godly seed. That's the biggest way to spread his gospel. That's the big, best of disciples are the ones, you know, that you raise either in your own house or house to house, <laughs> right? Okay, so that's how you bear fruit that remains. So, um, women, 
what God wants you to do. Release your heart and use your prophetic gifts in times of prayer and prophesying in the assembly. The reason why I'm sharing this is because sometimes women can feel like they're being beat down with the ordinances. But I want to share my understanding of what the scriptures say so that what women, uh, what God has instructed women to do. So, 1 Corinthians 11, you can release your heart and use your prophetic gifts in times of prayer and prophesying in the assembly. Uh, reverence your husband by asking him learning questions and discussing doctrine with your husband at home. 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, if you're unmarried or your husband is unsaved, you can ask an elder as well. Um, like we talked about earlier, Titus 2. Focus on teaching other married women in holiness submission and enjoyment of their families titus 2 talks about women elders women teach the younger women to enjoy their husbands to love their husbands which means phileo their husbands that means enjoy have brotherly love with your husband and your children so enjoy your husband and your children in holiness submission and enjoyment of their families and that's what the women are supposed to do focus on teaching unmarried women how to serve the lord Disciplined and undistracted. First Corinthians chapter seven. Okay. Like I said earlier, the ordinances are a reflection of the heart. They're a reminder to the mind and a sign to the eyes. God's ways order glorifies God in ways that we cannot control. Oftentimes, our ideas of glorifying God can backfire. Our ideas of glorifying God can backfire. But the ordinances glorify God in the way that he has prescribed. And they're guaranteed to glorify God. There's more glory to God for, just like we said in Titus, women obey your husbands that the word of God be not blasphemed. A lot of times a woman will get out and disobey their husband because they want to preach, they want to dis want to glorify God. Then it ends up, the word of God is ends up being blasphemed. All the time it happens. <laughs> so our ideas of glorifying God can backfire. <clears throat> Order is not a heaven or hell issue, but it is a fruit issue. It will show up in your fruit. And that's why we teach it, not to condemn people, but to help people to bear better fruit. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. I have ordained you, or one good thing to do on your own time is to look up every ordinance scripture, every time it says order, or ordinance, or ordain. All those related words, and look at them in the New Testament. Okay? God is smarter than us. Some disorder can lead us further, further into sin. There is disorder that leads to frustration. There is disorder to leads to divorce. And then the remarriage is adultery. So a lot of times disorder can lead to bigger sins. And so something that is not a heaven or hell issue can turn into a heaven or hell issue. If you let it. Alright, there's another tough topic. Um, all right, First Timothy 4. Why does Paul tell Timothy that we can eat every creature? Does that counsel out God's unclean and clean food laws in the Old Testament? First Timothy 4. First Timothy four three forgetting forbidding to marry and, com and commanding to abstain from foods the word it means is foods which God hath created to be re received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer all right so what principle of sound biblical interpretation are we going to use Number one, we're going to use one scripture cannot con 
contradict two or three witnesses. The Father, Jesus, the prophets, and the apostles are in harmony. Okay? So, uh, the Father agree. Jesus and the Father agree. The twelve apostles and Jesus agree. And Paul and Jesus agree with the twelve apostles as well. So, if Paul is teaching something, that means all the apostles agree. Okay, so if Paul says that all creatures are to be received and nothing to be refused, then that means he agrees with the Paul, with Jesus. So what did Jesus say? Um, okay, so we can only interpret Paul's writings with the lens of what Jesus said and what Jesus did. Instead of twisting Paul away from Jesus, let's interpret Paul according to what Jesus said and did. So first of all, let's look at the context. As an apostle, Timothy was on Paul's apostolic team. Timothy traveled with Paul. So Paul was apostle and he was writing a letter to who? Another apostle. That's the first key of understanding. Paul was coaching Timothy on how to spread the gospel to new lands. Especially what type of lands? Gentile lands, right? Timothy was an apostle also. This is a key to understanding. So this is a letter that's being written to an apostle by an apostle. How did Jesus tell the apostles to spread the gospel? He told them to go to people's house. He said to find somebody's house, post up in their house, eat what they give you, and spread the gospel that way, preach, teach, cast out demons, right? And then in, in the end of Mark, he said, when you eat something, Nothing shall by any means harm you. He said, if the serpent bites you, if you eat anything deadly, nothing shall by any means harm you. So Jesus was telling the apostles how to spread the gospel house to house, going to people's lands, going to people's houses and eating what they give you and preaching the gospel. Okay? So that's how he taught the apostles. So that's why, that's so, if, if Jesus taught the apostles how to do it, then he also taught Paul how to do it the same way. And then Paul was teaching Timothy how to do it the same way, right? So, Christ had already told his apostles to spread the gospel to the Gentiles. He had already told them that no poison shall harm them. And if they eat any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. Christ had already taught that spreading the gospel involves eating with friendly hosts in different cities. Okay? God gave, Jesus already gave Peter a vision to rise and eat unclean animals as a symbol of preaching and converting a what? Gentile household. This, mean, this meant that Gentile people were clean in the gospel. And that was seen in the book of Acts. Okay? The Hebrews, as a culture, tended to have pride in their separation from Gentile eating habits. This was a hindrance to the gospel. And Paul had already confronted Peter about that. Because he wouldn't eat with the Gentiles. Remember that in Galatians? Okay, so everything is in harmony. And so we know the purpose of eating whatever the, whatever the Gentile sets before you is for the spreading of the gospel. Okay, so we can start to make that link. So if he's writing to an apostle and saying, listen, nothing's be refused, you sit down. You know, and it even agrees with the idolatry scripture. He said, if you sit down and eat at a feast with a Gentile and they put something before you, go ahead and eat it. Unless they tell you that it's for an idol. If they tell you it's for an idol, then that's a hindrance to the gospel, so don't eat it if they tell you it's for an idol. So it's all types of harmony. Okay? So when you preach the gospel house to house, you shouldn't do it with a laundry list of, oh, I ain't eating this, I don't eat this, I don't eat that, I don't eat this, this. No, you're supposed to focus on the gospel and eat what they put before you. That's why the scripture is here. It's because when you're traveling to different lands, you can't say, Oh, I don't eat this, I don't eat that, I don't eat that. You're supposed to just eat what they put before you. And if it's something deadly, eat it, and it's not going to harm you. If they got parasites in it, and you don't know what it is, if they don't tell you what it is, they put a soup before you, you know, it's not going to harm you. <laughs> Worm swimming in it. doesn't mean you have to, but I'm saying, you know, the point is that if you eat any deadly thing, it will not, it will not harm you. Not to offend the people that you're preaching the gospel to by making them convert to Hebrew culture before they receive the gospel. And that's the context, and that's harmony. That's Paul harmonizing with the apostles, the apostles harmonizing with Jesus. Okay, 
So that does not mean that God's laws were voided or canceled. It means that even if you happen to eat poison or unclean or untainted food by accident just because you're in a Gentile land and they don't know, they don't know God's law yet, God will preserve your health for the sake of the gospel and not offending the, the kind, hospitable Gentile that is hosting you. Okay? So that doesn't cancel God's law. It's just the way that Jesus called them to preach the gospel as an apostle. You go to a new place, you eat what they put before you, and then you preach the gospel when you heal the sick, you cast out demons. You don't go and say, well, first of all, before I come inside your house, we're going to get rid of the swine. We're going to get rid of the shrimp. We're gonna rid no. You go, you preach the gospel, and you eat the gumbo, whatever's in it. <laughs> you know, and then you pray. <laughs> That God will cleanse you from the parasites and you fast with three. You know what I'm saying? You do what you got to do afterward, right? That doesn't mean God's law is canceled. So we you, <laughs> so we're using a rightly divide the word. <laughs> One scripture can't contradict all the other scriptures. Everybody agrees. The Father agrees with Jesus. Jesus agrees with the apostles. And Paul agrees with the 12 apostles. Okay? So... This does not cancel God's wisdom laws or his creation design laws. It only makes it easier to spread the gospel by focusing on being acceptable to hospitality when you're eating house to house with non-idolatrous or peaceable Gentiles. In essence, we don't need to judge people on what they eat and make that the biggest factor. It's a wisdom factor, but it's not the most important thing. All right. So... One thing we have to remember with the ordinances, and I'm going to end with this. I'm going to close. This is my first closing. Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm going to treat y'all like a preacher. Treat you. It's my first closing. We need to clean the outside of the cup, the inside of the cup, before we clean the outside. A lot of people twist that scripture and they'll say, well, you got to be, you can't clean the outside of the cup. You got to clean the inside of the cup. That's not what it said. It said, first clean the inside then the outside will be clean also. So when you know the heart of God on the inside and you clean the inside, the ordinances will automatically follow. It won't be a problem. Okay, we don't want to clean up the outside and the inside is dirty. But after the inside is clean, there should be evidence on the outside. He said if you clean the inside, the outside will be clean also. So if the outside is not clean, you know, you know the inside is not clean because he said if if you clean first the inside, the outside will be clean also. Okay, so we have to clean our hearts, get rid of our own glory, get rid of our own boasting in our flesh, get rid of our adultery as men, get rid of the adultery of our eyes and our hearts as women, get rid of the desire to the desire to entice adultery of the eyes. Um, we have to be be willing to. To, to set aside our own ideas and our own conceits and do things the way that God has prescribed so that we can have the integrity to rightly divide the word and do it with the heart of compassion, praying people through to fruitfulness, not, oh, you ain't you going to hell because you ain't doing it this way or you going to hell because you ain't doing it that way. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about our own fruit and making sure that our own fruit remains so we can be an example and then pray other pray our disciples through into further fruitfulness and along the narrow road. And with that, transformation mentality 2018 is finished. <laughs> so <laughs> praise yeah, hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to to go further in your truth. Uh, to not just be satisfied with surface and be satisfied with uh, just being saved and make it in, Lord. But we want to be fruitful, Lord. We want to be transformed by the renewing of our mind and really take a fresh look at your scriptures and see what you said, what you actually said. Help us to, to be able to rightly divide the word and use sound principles of biblical interpretation to make sure that we bear fruit that remains. Help us not to be confused anymore. Help us not to be um, have our inheritance stolen from us, Lord, with seminary scissors and with, um, with the lies of our culture and with trying to fit in. Help us to be a peculiar people uh, ready to walk in new covenant 
apostolic ordinances that have been set forth by Jesus Christ himself. Help us to bear fruit that remains and help us to multiply and help us to entrust these words with others. Help us to not just keep these words for ourselves, but help us to um, do your word, be doers of your word, and to help others uh, to do your word also so that our fruit can remain. We can glorify you the way that you have asked to be glorified so that our own ideas will stop backfiring on us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray for your glory. Amen. Amen.